So I like to do geeky things like calculate probabilities, right? Uh, some of you might have read this article, right? Uh, information, data is now the world's most valuable resource. Uh, we hear it all the time. We hear stories about Google and Facebook and Uber and Airbnb uh, thrown at us all the time. Uh, they just work and feed off the data we give them. But this is not that story. Uh, my name is Prashant Mohamaya. I have made a career in data. With a name like Mohamaya, you better make a career in data. <laughs> right? Uh, so people will believe you. Right? So uh, data is becoming intensely personal. Uh, we make decisions every day, uh, whether it is, you know, whom to date, there's Tinder out there, there is what to buy on Amazon, what to watch on Netflix. Uh, everywhere, you go outside, there are holdings, 50% discount, 70% discount, 20% more efficient. But what happens is, as you look at the newspapers, and I'm a big newspaper fan, right? I, I, I like the slow life, you know, the amazing talk before this. Uh, and I sit down and I look at all these stories going on, you know, uh, there's accidents, there's diversity, there's salaries, there's the elections, obviously, there's legal backlog. There's one common theme that is emerging. Data has gone from being on the sports pages and the business pages to the front pages. Right? Uh, but I'm sure many of you, even me, in many cases, I get intimidated by the data. Right? Uh, numbers are thrown at me. Uh, I sort of, you know, go through those numbers and I start thinking about them. Uh, and I, I am pretty accomplished at it. Right? I, I can understand what stats are, you know, what the analysis is saying, so on and so forth. But uh, I can imagine there are a lot of others uh, who undergo three stages. Uh, the one is, well, this that stats, I sort of hated that course in school. Uh, so I'm going to ignore all that the data says. The second one is, oh, the numbers are given with some, you know, hidden agenda behind them. So I'm going to ignore them completely. Uh, you know, I'm going to mistrust them. And the third, the most dangerous part, oh, these numbers are produced by an expert. Therefore, I should blindly trust them. Right? These are the three things that typically happen. Uh, let me take an example. Monsoon is coming. A uh, lot of you in this room, you know, know, I guess, how to read a weather report, right? Uh, and, and today they put nice shiny icons next to it. But let me give you this statement. It says, widespread showers of moderate rain will occur. You know, there's a whole bunch of weatherman jokes around. It says, when the weatherman says it rains, never carry the umbrella. Right? You heard a whole bunch of those jokes. But here is the interesting part. We make those jokes because we don't know how to read it. Let me tell you what it means. And, and, and I'll read it out. Right? When somebody says widespread, it tells you how much of the area will be covered. So if they are, have a forecast for Mumbai, it's telling you greater than 76% of Mumbai will have, face rain. So if I am standing here in Ghatkopar and it's raining in Vidya Vihar, I'm saying, I, I'll tell the weatherman is wrong, Gary. I it didn't rain. Right? Uh, because we'll say, oh, it didn't happen to me, so I don't trust it. A lot of things that happen are probabilistic in nature. Right? Uh, they, it's a matter of chance. Uh, the human brain is not very well adapted uh, to think about probabilities. Uh, we like the black and white stuff. There's a beautiful poster at the end. You know, go look at it. There's a black and white and there's the rainbow. Uh, something similar. We, the human brain mostly looks at stuff in black and white unless you train it to. And that is something I'll talk about pretty soon, that data is actually a language. Right? Uh, it has entered the mainstream. That is the paradigm shift. Right? Data is no longer confined to textbooks and expert reports and stuff like that. Data is coming at you from every possible angle. Uh, it's just that you have to train yourself to see stuff. Now, once upon a time, as with language, language was the forte of the priesthood, it was the forte of the scribes, it was, it was an expert profession. Those were the people who knew how to read and write. Right? When, when I was still growing up, 
you know, Rajawadi post office, I, I stay pretty close by, Rajawadi post office still used to have a person outside who would write letters for people to send home or fill up forms for people to send home because they don't know how to read and write. Uh, that's a problem we have to a large extent solved as a country. But the data literacy will open up and, and we had you know, other kinds of literacy. But here is one fundamental premise. Data is a language, language implies literacy. Right? Uh, you need to be able to view, read and consume. So when you have something in front of you, you should be able to understand what that is. Right? You should be able to think about it. Here is a number. What does it mean? Right? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for the community around me? I should, you should be able to argue with that data. You should be able to comprehend. Right? And then once you have done these two in terms of literacy, you need to be able to communicate, right? You need to be able to author, write, create. Or did I just say create and people are saying, Prashant, you're crazy. Data and creativity, right? They don't go together. Uh, let me show you an example. Uh, many people would have heard of Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale uh, is the lady responsible for nursing as a modern profession, right? Uh, this was, uh, and, and I'm a big history buff, this was in, you know, what is called the Crimean War. Uh, people were dying, there's a war, people die. Uh, but here's the interesting part, she was a nurse. Uh, in the middle, right, the, you see the reddish part. The reddish part shows people who are actually dying due to battlefield wounds. On the outside, the grayish blue kind of part, are people who actually died because they were not treated properly of causes that were preventable. Uh, and, and the statisticians used to send data off to the war office in London and you know it, the members of parliament got it and stuff like that, uh, but nobody acted on it. It was till the time Florence Nightingale actually compiled this, it became instantly understandable and it caused a huge change change in the way sanitary conditions in hospitals were managed uh, during the war, uh, how food was managed, uh, how patients were segregated, you know, the washing of hands. I mean, there's like a whole bunch of basic stuff uh, that came in because somebody took the pains to explain this data to them. Right? Uh, let's take another example. Right? I'll give you another example. Uh, closer to home. Uh, imagine there are four jobs. Right? And you'll see all this, this all the time. You imagine there are four jobs uh, and somebody push, puts this table in front of you. It says, uh, if my average experience is nine months, and let's say this is a like really high profile job, you make seven and a half lakh rupees a month. Right? You're sitting on the outside, you're looking at this data, and you are imagining, wow, right? I have four jobs to choose from, and this is amazing. But let's take a deeper look. Uh, before I go there, one of the biggest tenets uh, of data literacy is a healthy mistrust of summary numbers. If somebody gives you one number to think about, right, uh, you need to question that person or their motives very deeply because one number is trouble. Let's drill down. So this is job A. Uh, job A, you know, these are individual data points that make up the average. Right? Uh, looks like, you know, this, this is pretty consistent. Uh, you know, I get a job, my average salary will be around, you know, uh, seven and a half lakhs. This is job B. It still has exactly the same average, by the way. Right? But, uh, you know, and, and I was imagining what kind of a job would have this. Imagine an aging sports person. Right? Because when you hit, hit a peak, you get a lot of money and then your value tapers off. You may make money in other cases, but your main sport value goes down. Right? So as you grow older, you're going to make less money here. The third one is uh, probably this is not the right culture. The third and I'll, I'll put the fourth one here as well, because there are outliers. There is this one point that demolishes the average. Uh, and, and I love quoting this example. 
uh, and, and you know, you will relate to it. What if I made the statement, at an average, the roads of Mumbai are absolutely flat? What would you say to that? Right? Because you know they are not. Right? Because the number of potholes is equal to the number of bumps. Right? That, that's the way the roads of Mumbai are. Uh, you wouldn't say that they are flat, but we do this with averages all the time. Right? We walk in Mumbai, we drive in Mumbai, we realize it. But the moment somebody puts in something that you don't know about, it's very difficult for you to question that number. Let's go one further. And I'm going to just take one story. Uh, there's a major daily as in uh, looking at the newspaper and says, who killed 600, 361 walkers? Right? And news titles have this attraction, right? Oh, who killed, right? Uh, they want to generate that sensationalism. Uh, so this, this is the chart. And they put a nice bubble around it. And, and they make a claim that the number of deaths came down by 15%. Let's examine this claim for a moment. So I'm going to do a couple of things here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the way the data is represented. Uh, bubbles are not really good for comparisons. Uh, that, that's the way the brain works. Uh, but I just put it on a trend. Right? Because we understand trends very well. Trends are looked at as slope. Uh, and I can absolutely see the first chart there is accidents. And accidents are going down. Uh, very nice. And they have sort of stabilized. The second one is deaths. And deaths have gone down as well. Right? So, so they are correct. Right? Deaths have reduced. But let me bring in a third analysis here. Percentage of fatalities, right? So for every road accident, or every thousand, hundred road accidents in here, how many people are likely to die? And by the way, that is going up. So if I was to look at that story from a different angle, if I get hit as a pedestrian, my chances of death are higher, right? Nobody talks about that, right? That's a different perspective on the story. That is something that you need to think about, right? Because people will give you a story from a certain angle always. And the angle is generally sensational because nobody wants to know the normal. Right? Nobody reports on, okay, a flight took off from Mumbai and reached you know, Delhi safely. No. Right? No, no, no. That doesn't make news. Crashes make news. Bad news makes news. Right? Normal news does not make news. So whenever you see something like this, think about what else is missing. Let's come to the last sort of, I had couple of things to say before I conclude. Uh, data literacy is cultural change, right? And, and we have seen it, right? We have the India Literacy Mission uh, that has done an absolutely brilliant job of getting our literacy up in, in the last 40 odd years. Uh, we have the new, you know, Beti Bachao, Beti Parao uh, mission uh, that, that is doing absolute wonders. But literacy is a culture, right? Literacy has to be a part of the culture. Uh, if and culture grows around communities. It does not grow around individuals. You have to get people together uh, and talk about these things. Uh, are you data-based, fact-based in your decision uh, or your conversations? So culture requires behaviors. Or culture determines behaviors, I would say. So here is the first behavior that I would like you to inculcate. Be uncomfortable. Especially cautious of summary numbers. Any number thrown at you, look at it and say, why? Why are you giving me this number? What does this number mean? What is the numbers behind this number? What's hiding? What's not visible? Be uncomfortable. Number two, be curious. Let your discomfort not make you cynical. Let it make you skeptical. Right? Skepticism requires investigation. You will go investigate what is behind the number. Have that curiosity, saying that what lies behind this. Once you have that, the third behavior is be open to surprises. Because data may give you stuff that you are uncomfortable with. Uh, we all live with something called biases. Right? Uh, and they are... Uh, you know, in us, because of the communities we grew up in, you know, the way we studied, the way we were organized, you know, from all sorts of things, right? Society has biases. Uh, 
uh, there is nothing to break biases, demolish biases, better than being data-based, fact-based. And if you are good with it, you creative with it, you are able to communicate with it, uh, you can help bring down barriers in society. So, in the words of one of my data heroes, uh, Hans Rosling, uh, he said, uh, always carry opinions that are backed by strong data or facts. Uh, that is really critical uh, because it's just the things that are around us today. Right? Uh, and finally, uh, data to the people. Thank you very much.